welcome to the 66th event of the webinar series we've been running for close to 16 months. This one is different than all that we've done till now. This is devoted fully to a film called Built Beautiful, uh, an architecture and neuroscience love story. What it is will be told by Mr. Donald and others during the course of the two hour session that we have. I'm doing something else. I'm just introducing the webinar series within which this particular event is taking place. As you know, in half that's Habitat Forum and its many partners, local and international, are hosting this webinar series on the theme Rethinking City since June last year. In over 65 webinars, over 350 experts, specialists, planners, economists, development thinkers, young professionals, and community groups have shared their concerns, ideas, and perspectives on a number of urban issues and themes. Let me tell you why we are doing this for such a long time. Why have we reached 66th webinar today? And what is the purpose? What is sought to be achieved by this effort? This webinar series is an integral part and fits into an initiative in half and partners have launched last year called City URI, Citizen Urban Initiative. It's a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the complex urban challenge. It's a three-part task. One, reassessing India's urban challenge. Two, rethinking Indian city. And three, reformulating response in the context of the national development challenges, not only the urban challenges. This is in response to recognition that our cities are not in, when I say our cities, I mean Indian cities are not in good health and India's urban systems are faltering in many respects, be that environment or governance or finance or planning or equitable growth and sustainable development. The cities as they are, as they grow and develop seem to convey that things are not what they should be and need an urgent re-see, rethink, and react in policy, program, institutions, and investment. There is an unspoken silent emergency and the missing urgency and creativity in response is causing harm in economic, environmental, and human terms. With the COVID pandemic opening many fault lines in our economy, society, and ways of living, and the climate change knocking on the door, both the short-term problem solving and long-term planning must reckon with the need for a major change in how we see, plan, and develop our cities. With the cities contributing nearly 65% to the national GDP already, and the urban population growth estimate suggesting 870 million people 
in the cities by 2050 in 30 more years only, India could ill afford underperformance in addressing the complex urban challenge. The stakes are high, be that quality of living of millions of people or the nation's dream of a $5 trillion economy. With all the cities need to be rethought and reorganized. That is not to say that Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, Smart Cities Program, Amrat and the Toilet Mission do not matter or not help. They have. The point is that the response to the challenge needs much more than what is on offer, a paradigm shift in the mindset and thinking out of box in search of better and more appropriate solutions. This webinars are meant to open the much needed societal dialogue on how we handle urbanization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of economic growth minus the exploitative instincts and damaging traits such as natural resource depletion, carbon footprint, and deeply disturbing inequality. The goal is to aim for and work towards economically productive, socially just, politically participatory, environmentally sustainable, culturally vibrant, technologically adaptive, and people-centric cities. It's a demanding challenge and a daunting task, especially as our energy and resources are limited. We as individuals, organization, and institutions tend to do what we know to do and what is doable. Time also comes where we must do what is required to be done. And we believe that the urban challenge falls in that category. So that is the dominant message of this webinar series, that we have got to act, that we have got to act collectively, and that we've got to act fast if we want a better future for our cities and for our nation. Before I hand this over to, to Mr. Donald, who is, uh, whose film this is and who is going to introduce it, let me kind of introduce him briefly. Donald Ruggles is a practicing architect and CEO of Ruggles Mabed Studio, an award-winning boutique residential architecture and interior design firm based in Colorado. Founded in 1970, the firm is dedicated to the idea that beauty can improve the lives of its clients, representing more than 1,000 projects spanning 16 states and 18, eight countries. In 2017, 2017, he published Beauty, Neuroscience and Architecture, Timeless Patterns and Their Impact on Our Well-Being, which investigates how design affects our health and well-being. This film is going to show all this and he and others on the panel are going to talk and discuss it. Thank you very much, Donald. Now it's all yours. Please take over and 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 start uh, the the series webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurti. That that was a wonderful introduction. Yes, I'm Don Ruggles, one of the producers of the movie Built Beautiful. And you'll see uh, Nikos and Anne a little bit later. Um, they uh, were part of the movie as well. So one of the uh, initial 
group of uh, professionals that helped pull this together. So, and as Curti just said, this movie is based on the book that I wrote about five years ago. And in the process of promoting the book and giving lectures, people started saying to me, oh, you should think about making a movie. Um, it's such an interesting topic. And I happen to have a good friend here in Denver, Colorado, that is a movie maker. And I approached him and we laid out uh, a process to assemble the financial team and the production team. And then off we went, um, interviewing professionals from around the world. Over 20 of them are included in the movie. And it's focused on the emerging field of neuroaesthetics and dealing with our biology and psychology and neurology and how it affects us, how, uh, how the built environment affects us, mostly at a subliminal level, uh, which then translates into very real physical manifestations, many of them quite negative. So neuroaesthetics is an emerging field that's respectful of the minds and senses of human beings and has the vast potential, I think, and many think, to change forever how we conceptualize and create and experience architecture. I'd like to thank Curdy and Anka Shaw and the entire Inhofe team for giving us the opportunity to screen this film. Inhofe is exhibiting great leadership in the design world with a positive and forward thinking attitude that's helping the entire profession to evolve to a new model where beauty and tradition become essential factors in the design process. This is truly a remarkable step and great, great effort. So Built Beautiful is a little over an hour long, and I suspect you'll experience some new ideas here that will ignite your thinking, I hope. So without further ado, I'll let you move over to the uh, Zoom site now to watch Built Beautiful. I hope you enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the movie. Thanks so much. Beauty is in the brain of the beholder, and our brains are more similar than they're different. I hate to break it to you, we evolved without buildings. And the brains and bodies we have arrive in the world expecting not to see buildings. We're really about living in the wild. Beauty is not dependent on the human things but anything that is described as beauty is described through the lens of being a human. You respond to the patterns through your visceral responses, your, your biological responses, and the result is a wonderful experience that you feel biologically, you feel subconsciously. The sensibilities of how our bodies feel comfort as we progress through a building, move in and out from one space to the next, that sense of shifting perspective. Architecture is really more than just a functional space because we consume buildings, we don't experience building. Clearly, architecture has ramifications on our health and we need to understand what are the ideas that support health and well-being urban environment matters for our mental and physical health. We need to empirically care about that and understand about it. And the exciting thing is we are starting now to have that public debate. We need to respond to the people who are going to be using these places. And we need to study these people. And we need to analyze what's going on in their head. And we need to make that a big part of the design process going forward. Okay, so everyone, welcome back. Uh, please, our participants, turn on your, uh, your camera and microphones. So um, now begins the second part of our, um, our webinar. 
after the film. Um, so there are really two separate webinars here. One was the live screening of the film and the second one is without the film because the film is a commercial film and it's under copyright. So the recorded video that will be posted online will not contain the film, um, will only contain the trailer. So I, I'm going to ask uh, the participants to summarize what was said in the film for the uh, benefit of those who are joining after the um, uh, after the screening. So, uh, bef uh, and then I'm uh, uh, later I'm going to, to do the important task of relating the film and its message to uh, Inhaf and the Kirti Shah's mission of fixing urbanism in India. It's not obvious, but I'm going to explain that, but that's afterwards. So to begin with, uh, thanks to Donald Ruggles, we have seen a commercial film that's extremely high quality, uh, despite the transmission problems we had, it was a bit jittery. But this is a, a commercial film ex of extremely high quality that has not been released yet. After it is released, it will be possible to see it only if you pay a lot of money to rent and, and view the film. So thank you, Donald, for this tremendous gift to the architects of India and whoever was uh, smart enough to to tune in to watch the film free online. So um, for the benefit of those who will watch the, uh, the recorded video, I would like to ask uh, uh, our participants first, Donald, and then Anne, and then Alexandros, to summarize the message of the film um, for the record. So please, uh, Donald, can you, can you start that? I, I will, yes. Um make sure everything's set up here properly. Um, you know, the, the essential message of uh, this film is that our subliminal nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, is picking up signals from our built environment and it affects how we, how we feel, how um, our, our health and well-being, and uh, this is important information for architects and designers to be aware of. And um, I think Anne Sussman has looked into this quite a bit in her research. And I know, Nikos, you've been championing um, biophilia for many years, which is uh, all part of a subliminal autonomic nervous system response system. And now uh, Alexandros has you know, become part of our team and, and his work is equally remarkable in leading architects to understanding what the subliminal cues are coming from architectural forms and how uh, it impacts our health and well-being. And this is culture changing. Um, and it, it's something, you know, we're just starting to look at uh, certainly, it's, it's going to be a difficult, I think, uh, problem to unwind, but um, it's, it's there. We, need, we can't turn away from it. We, we need to pay attention to this. And, um, you know, Anne is doing a lot of work with eye tracking, which is a, a subliminal response that happens pre-attentively. I'll let her talk about that because she's an incredible expert on this. Um, but th that's just one way. A galvanic skin response is another. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging is another way of measuring our uh, autonomic nervous system response. So we're, we're starting to uncover ways to measure this, quantify it, and let that be uh, guiding uh, architects and design designers towards solutions that support our health and well-being. So that's the fundamental message of of our film. How'd that sound? And. Well well done. It was really well done. And it was great to see the movie again and realize how good it is. And I think what's brilliant about the movie is 
you're showing that a lot of modernism was based on this false tabula rasa principle. You know, the mind's a blank slate. The mind is not a blank slate. We're hardwired for really specific patterns. And when we go to places that ignore those patterns nature's built in, we don't feel at home, we're gonna be stressed. Our brain won't know where to look. And I think your movie's great because it really shows like, whoa, what we've been doing the past century <laughs> really isn't in our best human interest because it no ignores how human beings function. And so you're bringing to the fore something we never talked about, <laughs> the human nervous system. That was never mentioned in our architectural education, was it, Dodd? No, never. We, we were it never mentioned. The word emotion never shows up in the architectural licensing exam. The word health and well-being doesn't show up either, nor does happiness. <laughs> so to bring all these things and the word beauty, that was, you could never say that. Not one architectural crit ever said that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, John. Absolutely. But I think Absolutely. your movie made a great point too, that beauty brings us together. Beauty makes us connect, not only with the place, but with each other. You showed Sagrada Familia, and just before uh, the pandemic in January 2020, I was in Sagrada Familia, and it was the most transporting experience where I was with 300 or more people from all over the world. We were all in it together. We were all in awe. You felt, oh my gosh, look what architecture can do. And that's, that's, that's so beautiful. Wow. Amazing. Alexandros. So nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for the film. So I don't know how we're doing for time. I, I wanted to, to speak about some, some points if I have 10 minutes or something on the film. Please. Yeah. Nikos, how are you? Yeah. So I absolutely agree with everything that has been said so far. The film is wonderful. I also wanted to say that we start watching this film and you see Renee Fleming talking about beauty and then the title music is the overture to the magic flute that's Albert Flete and you're saying, okay, it's definitely going to be something beautiful. And I actually thought that if Karagan was alive, the conductor, he would be all over this because he was interested in autonom autonomic responses to art, music in particular since the early seventies, he was conducting sometimes wearing uh, EKG sensors. So, uh, I mean, for, for experiments, you know, for concerts. So um, just a few things I wanted to say, a few points. One was about sensor integration, about making sense of a place. This, I think, is very important. We see the, the, the lack of this in some buildings. I think in, in some cases, in the New Acropolis Museum in Athens, you walk over glass corridors. I mean, it's a nice museum, but uh, in, on, on the inside. You walk over glass corridors, and you feel some old people feel not safe because they have conflicted information. Uh, they, they, they step on a, on a solid plane, but their eyes tell them that there's nothing there um, because the senses should make what we call a nomological network that should make sense of the whole place. And this, this doesn't happen in some, in some buildings. And you know, this is the equivalent of what, what happens if you have uh, paroxysmal positional vertigo uh, you get different information about your position from your eyes and to, from your inner ear. That's, that's quite annoying. Uh, yeah, I wanted also to say that we're definitely a, a part of recognizing machine. Uh, it was already mentioned that babies look at faces and they prefer attractive faces. Uh, this is the same reason why people look, for, look at pictures of Mars and they see sculpted faces on it because that's what they want to recognize. And, uh, I mentioned in the last meeting that we have even a snake recognizing circuit in our thalamus. So that is something very specific. And we need this for survival. Many people said that. So obviously the tabula rasa idea is, is very bad. Of course, it is in vogue now with the, so the, whole, the whole concept that everything is socially constructed, but science doesn't support this. Um, the idea of uh, us being connected to ourselves and to other people in places that work, actually, I think this is a wonderful way to say it, Professor Ellen said it, because this also um, describes uh, some of the functions of the default mode network, a network in our brains, 
that is related to self-reference, to emotions about oneself, but also the theory of mind, to thinking about other people's feelings and emotions. And we, know, we now know that the default mode network is used to perceive fractals, specifically fractals. So all these seem to, to come together. It's what Nikos was saying, information from different points seem to come together. Um, the, the points of uh, coherence, fascination, and hominess, I would say it's very important, and also what Professor Chatterjee said, and also relevant to social housing in India and other places, because often these new sanitized places um, lack especially hominess, but even, even fascination and coherence, because people just see them as, as cold and remote and irrelevant to them. Regarding the different levels of consciousness, of conscious, um, I would just like to, to clarify for the people who maybe are not uh, neuroscientists. When we say sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs, we mean sympathetic and parasympathetic inducing inputs. Yes, so we see something, we experience something that's a central nervous system event, and that induces sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, reactions to the body as we see, for example, with the galvanic uh, skin response. And this is what, of course, translates into, um, in, in, into health consequences, yes. But there's also another level in which uh, consciousness and unconscious events are, are divided into. It was already mentioned that we are conscious only of 50 bits per second of the, of the millions of bits that come in of the information and eye tracking as mentioned, is, is a way to understand the pre-attentive processing, which is pre-conscious of, of the scene. And also, beyond that, which is um, a way to quickly react to stimuli, which is important for our survival, there is the notion uh, by some neuroscientists uh, Zeki is one of them, was one of the founders of uh, neuroaesthetics, that there are actually many micro consciousnesses in our, in our brain. And that is verified in a way by phenomena like the, the motion vision of the blind. There are people that have, that are blind but can understand motion because the area responsible for, for motion is intact whereas the central visual area is, 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 uh, is damaged. So uh, we, we seem to be made up from different micro-consciousnesses and what we consider as ourself is, a, is, a, is, an emergent, is an emergent whole. And of course, intuition is subconscious computation. That's what gut feeling is and people should not disregard it. Uh, I have a quote actually from a paper from Zeki, which I, I, I loved when I saw it, is that people should not forget that the brain is a superb measuring device that continually executes measurements, be they measurements of light intensity or the degree of hate or desire. So that's very important. So gut feeling is, is very important. And of course, uh, as you, you mentioned in the film, the, the disappearance of the, the term beauty, and as uh, Anne also mentioned, um, and yet we seem to have specific area in the brain, the medial or the, or the frontal cortex, which is what always lights up when we consider something beautiful. Uh, and even doesn't have to be a building, it can be music and the mathematics. So there is something specific about beauty and how our brain reacts to it. Um, the sublime seems to be different. Um, philosophically, but also neuroscientifically, as it has been proven. And my, my personal idea is that this is why uh, luxury skyscrapers uh, are attractive to some as housing, because they have an aspect of this danger uh, that, causes, that, uh, that, that creates the sense of the sublime. But at the same time, they're dreadful as social housing because they have none of that, they only have alienation. And of course, what is it about nature? What is it about the nature of, of, of what is it about nature that creates these effects? And I think 
this is a very important task for neuroscience to explore. I think Nikos is a is is a pioneer in this because he was the first person to try to to codify what is it about the um, the geometry of nature that translates into these effects on us and that can be found in architecture or not in, in many cases. And um, finally, um, the things that Nicholas Boy Smith mentioned about music, I think it's a very good point. The difference is that architecture is imposed on us, music is not imposed on us. And I would also like to, 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 to close closing just to say that there are, I mean, I have written about this some years ago. I think there are similarities and there are definitely similarities between language and music. And I think we can also find similarities between these two and, and architecture and shape. Um, I think that the, 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 the danger about design becoming prescriptive um, is not, well, it's not real because it would be the equivalent of saying that music composition becomes prescriptive if you follow the laws of harmony or that uh, you are um, somehow uh, not free to, la to write literature uh, as you should to express yourself if you follow grammar and syntax. So I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the grammar and syntax of, 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 um, of architecture as um, codified through those forms and as reflected in our in our brains. So thank you very much. I tried to not to take too much time, but I wanted to, to make these points. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, any more comments on uh, reviewing and summarizing the film's contents before I jump in? Okay, so let me jump in. First, I want to review the film's contents. <clears throat> for those of uh, for the viewers who are joining in the um, video who did not see the film, uh, this is nothing less than a revolution in the way we see architecture because uh, neuroscience experiments show that the human body reacts in a certain very precise way. And now we have the tools coming from the medical profession to measure the way that we react to architecture. And we can tell if a certain building, a certain space, a certain urban space, a certain surface is healing or if it's uh, harmful and anxiety inducing. So this is a revolution in architecture and um, it, is, it has not been implemented yet simply because this film is not released publicly. <laughs> We're waiting for Donald to release the film publicly and it's going to make a revolution in architecture. But uh, everyone who, who joined the INHAP symposium got a chance to watch the film. So uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, architects who, uh, who continue to produce buildings that cause anxiety after the revolution, which we hope is soon, are uh, going to be guilty of professional malpractice because they have the evidence that their buildings may make some people ill, either psychologically ill or physically ill in the long term. It's a question of public health, just like the, the smoking uh, exactly. or, 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 or uh, uh, the, uh, the original Coca-Cola that had cocaine in it to, to give you a boost. That's why it became so popular. Okay, so it, it, it is for regulatory bodies to jump in it's a question of health, it's no longer aesthetics. Now, during the film, and if you missed the film, you missed, you know, a little, a little clip that Nicholas Boy Smith of London, who is, who is the chair of the Build Beautiful Commission in the United Kingdom, Nicholas Boy Smith showed the results of surveys, uh, which were confusing. Uh, what building do you like best? And, and you ranked six or seven buildings from the most, one that's most comfortable to the one that you hate because it makes you feel anxious. Well, the, the, the survey was confusing until it was separated into the two groups. So they separated two groups of the people who took the survey and one group had exactly the opposite responses of the other group. And what was the result? The result was astounding. <clears throat> the common people, the ordinary people loved the more traditional, more humane sort of buildings and hated 
the jagged, uh, inhuman, faceless uh, modernist types of buildings. And the group, the second group was the architecture students and they had their, their, uh, their um, responses reversed. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that we are training students by reversing the wiring of their brain to become unnatural and to, to like the opposite of what's good for our health. Let me repeat that because it's so important. Architecture schools for the last several decades teaching Bauhaus principles have been reversing the brain's responses so that when architects come out of architecture school, they think they're doing something beautiful. In fact, it is ugly and it ruins the, the, uh, the user's health. This is a tremendous thing and it, it, will, has, to read, it has to lead to a revolution in the way we, uh, we teach architecture. So uh, let me stop there. <clears throat> So th that concludes my review of the film. And now I want to do, go into a completely different topic because we have here Kirti Shah, who has invited us very graciously to show the film in his seminar. Now, Kirti Shah is, uh, is a concern for the last uh, 40 years or so with fixing India's cities. India's cities have tremendous problems. There are tens of millions of poor people with, with uh, in barely acceptable living conditions. And uh, the government has been trying to help, but the government has been ineffective in helping. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, we know that uh, uh, the Prime Minister um, uh, Narendra Modi has promised to build 20 million new houses. All indications are that the 20 million new houses will probably be wasted because the, the basis on designing the new parts of the cities and the new houses are simply not there. There is one small piece that is missing and that small piece has been given today by our friends in the film. Let, let me say what that small piece is. Uh, I, have, I have been listening to some of the uh, webinars in the past and all the pieces seem to be in place in order to fix India cities in a humane way, but one small piece is missing. So for example, uh, but recently I, I, I listened to the talk by Rumi, who outlined how we have uh, bottom-up uh, mechanisms in India where you get surveys of the citizen, including the slum dwellers, and, and uh, all the opinions are taken in and put together, and, and, and uh, the information is digested and, 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 uh, and coordinated and then presented to the authorities. But then the authorities fail to act on this information, or even if they act, the result is inhuman. Why is that? Because even today in India, there is a higher religious authority that says new cities have to look like the Bauhaus Weissenhof Siedlungen. They have to look industrial. They have to look uh, concrete or glass, and they have to be rigidly ordered that's not the way Indian cities are built. The way Indian cities are built are in these self-built settlements. It is a totally different geometry. And when people build their own houses, they make them beautiful because it is an expression. The human being creates something that is beautiful. The human being creates a baby and that is the most beautiful thing possible to a mother and to the father. The same way. The human being creates their own houses out of uh, available materials and there could be scrap materials and it has to be beautiful. Nobody teaches a person who builds uh, something in a slum how to build something, but these spaces are beautiful. So all they need is to make this link of beauty and, and to just get away from this um, uh, top down, uh, a higher authority, which is stuck in the minds of both architects and government officials, that houses have to be this industrial Bauhaus style. It is not beautiful. So what happens if you have 20 million new houses built with the best of intentions, they're going to be ugly and the people will hate them and they will hate the government who built them. And then if the government forcibly moves them from the old slum with terrible living conditions, but they have the spatial and geometrical beauty, then they will hate the government. You will have civil unrest. I'm, I'm talking about this and, and uh, I'm urging politicians to, um, uh, to pay attention to this. So uh, the profession needs to change. And, and the key, I believe, 
we are offering the key to this missing piece, but it is an important, it's a small piece, but it's missing in order to connect with the self-planning and, and, and all the participation in order to give the result that is beautiful. So this is the answer to the original question. Here we have shown a film and we have comfortable, well-fed Westerners who showed a film made about Western architecture. Okay, we had a, a Indian cousin, Adnan Chatterjee, a non-resident Indian. That was by chance because he's a medical doctor. But uh, these are Westerners talking about beauty. What should, why should India care about that? Because everything that is built for the poor people and, and to re, uh, re, uh, 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 rebuild the cities has to be beautiful, otherwise it's going to be a failure. So the message that we carry over from this film translates into the Indian reality. Please, please don't build anything that is ugly by copying the worst that the West did in the 1930s and 20s. Please build something that is beautiful. And how do you adjust beauty? The ordinary poor person knows what is beautiful. They feel it inside them. It's only the architects who don't know what's beautiful. And it's, it's the codes in the, in the uh, urban laws, in the master plans, I'm sorry to say, that encode ugliness uh, because of, of these uh, um, ideas of efficiency uh, and industrialization. So why do we need um, to pay attention to beauty for the poor people? Every government throughout history has treated poor people as, as just a... Uh, unimportant. Well, I'm sorry to say, no, I'm sorry to say, I'm proud to say, poor people have nothing. They are struggling to survive. Beauty is the only thing that they have. Please give them the beauty and help them for everything else, economical prosperity and, and, and running water and, and infrastructure and toilets, but don't deny their beauty. That's number one. And we have been doing that. And that has been a tremendous mistake. Okay, I will, I will be quiet now and let's go on now to the question and answer. And uh, please everyone jump in and uh, let's continue this discussion. Okay, well, if you want prompting, we have a question here and I think uh, uh, Anne uh, should uh, answer that. Uh, there was a question. Um, um, how does this tie in with uh, sustainability and neuroscience and architecture? And can you um, answer the question? Well, to, 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 I'll try to answer it. To, to build for people, you have to appreciate what we are and what we need. Um, there's a great quote by Steve Jobs of all people, the Apple founder. The broader our understanding of the human experience, the better design we will have. And so the more you understand the human's need to see beauty, the human need to be able to feel comfortable walking on their street, um, the, more you, the more you understand that the human brain, if you do eye tracking, you learn pretty quickly. People don't know how to regulate around glass facade buildings because the brain is, can't, doesn't know how to look at them. Um, and, and so the more you understand um, how the human brain works, the, the better we can design. There's a simple thing you can do too that I love to tell my students to do is a preference test. Go to a local store. Um, in Boston, you can go to the Harvard Coop or in Cambridge, the Harvard Coop and go look at the postcard section. What postcards are they selling of Boston or Cambridge or Harvard? And what you find that they sell are only postcards of the traditional and old buildings. There'll be pictures of modern buildings, but very, very far at a distance um, at a, as a skyline, but never up close. So it's quite ironic to me that even though there are buildings by Gropius and Le Corbusier at Harvard, there's not one postcard for sale of those buildings when you go to the Harvard Coop. Why? Because the human brain subliminally, when you're buying a postcard, it's very quick that they don't attract you. You can't, you'll go bankrupt making postcards of those buildings. All the buildings at Harvard are, are, are the, the Georgian buildings, the 19th century buildings, the 18th century, mm -hmm. brick facade, lots of detail, bilateral symmetry, the patterns we talked about in the film. 
So I think you need to really appreciate what humans are. I think there's also this confusion that's fascinating to me as a baby boomer, this idea about being modern. Um, I think after World War I and World War II, such upheaval, there was this notion in the 50s and 60s that we were modern. And, and that kind of led us astray because now scientists know the human brain and body isn't modern. It's the one we have is a hunter gatherer. It's 40,000 years old, <laughs> hasn't changed. And, and we're a hunter gatherer primate and you have to really design for that animal. And that, that it's very specific what we want to look at and patterns in nature are what we evolved to see. And that's what we still need to see in our built environment. Um, what Nikos was saying though about building the future, we wanna build a future where people can be happy in the public realm. But I do see things shifting. In the city of Boston, they now have a director of the public realm. Imagine that to make sure people can feel safer and happier walking, biking on city streets. That's a new idea. And that's starting to happen. So I think this shift that this, this movie is talking about, it's a beginning, but it's a, it's a pivotal foundational shift to really understand how modernism didn't work and to appreciate, to design well for people, you have to design for what they are. And we're not modern guys. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm making sense, but. <laughs> Uh, I would like to read the question from uh, the question and answer by Ashish. Um, can we say that better architects are those who can realize their own instincts as emotions, bridging the design proposal as designer as well as user? If so, then human instincts become a common point of study between designers and users. Who would like to begin answering that question? Alexandros, why don't you take that? Well, I, I already put a thumbs up at the question because I think this is definitely true. Uh, it's what I was saying earlier that what we call instinct is in fact the result of information processing. Um, the fact that we cannot describe it in words or in, in a mathematical formula doesn't make it any more, any less uh, interesting or any less valid. So I think if there is you no know, one, uh, take home message from what we watched earlier, it's definitely that. I would like to add uh, to that answer. Uh, if we all worked on instinct, we would not have the problems, the severe problems that we face today. But there is a, a professional class that has had its instincts reversed through training. And therefore, when uh, bottom-up solutions are proposed for a part of a city or for even for a single building, they are condemned and they're not implemented because the authorities go to a certain reference that is pro propagated since uh, 1920s Germany of inhuman architecture, of, of concrete boxes or glass boxes. Uh, and uh, so, and that overrides because that is entrenched in the power, which is the construction industry and the government. So it is not enough. The only, the only uh, tool we have now to reverse that terrible misunderstanding is the scientific data, which shows that instinct is right. We have the scientific data. We did not have this data 20 years ago or 30 years ago when, when the government bulldozed beautiful sections of, of the city which just needed some a little upgrading and, uh, and to build monstrosities, uh, monstrous high rises that the people hate. Now we understand why the people hate them. Okay, it is not, uh, the, uh, up until now, the profession's response was a stupid one. They would say, well, the common people hate these buildings because the common people are ignorant. No, the common people know more than the professionals because the common people go with their heart with their body and their body's telling them that this is bad for their health, this is ugly. So we need to pay attention to this instinct and science is finally coming in to help uh, what, what should be uh, something obvious. Uh, Anne, do you wanna comment? <clears throat> well, I, no, I, 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 think, I think what you're saying is, is, is really true. I think when you really start studying this more and more, you learn pretty quickly that reality, human reality is a construct between your eye and your brain. 
And essentially our evolution then has preset what we need to see. And that includes something we rarely talk about, narrative coherence in cities. So old cities, and um, I remember seeing this in Siena, Italy, when I was in my 20s, not knowing any Italian, wandering in that city and feeling so at home there. It made no sense. But the city had narrative coherence. And I knew where to walk. I understood where the town square was. I could tell where the important buildings in the town square was instantly without speaking Italian. And narrative coherence you get in all human settlement except modern. That's when narrative coherence collapses. It becomes fractured, fractured and it becomes dissociated. And, and, but humans need narrative, not only in the stories we tell ourselves, but in the, in the stories we implicitly feel when we walk in a place. And so that's something that the new city building in India needs to really think about. Is it gonna have the narrative coherence that people implicitly crave? So they'll know where to walk and how to go and where and implicitly understand the space. And because human beings are wired for narrative, not only in what we read in the stories we tell, but in how we experience a place, how we know where to go and feel and feel at home there. I think that's really important. And dissociation is the hallmark of the modern public realm, which keeps people in their cars and pe keeps people from being together, which really is not what we can't sustainably do that anymore. If I may add something, I think it is, it is characteristic what, what's happening. It's very typical that people are fed all this, but they have a, a need for something else. They have a need for something to connect to, okay? Now, it has become very difficult to find architects that build buildings like that, that, that connect with you, or even sometimes craftsmen that know how to do it. So you end up, you see people building these buildings that are really, funny they're like cartoon cartoon um, representations of, of what their ideal house would be like they're like pastiche then these are viewed by the modernist architects and they say oh this is ridiculous is this what you really want let me make you a nice box but uh, it, it has you know it has become this or that and it's it's a vicious vicious circle because the less if the fewer professionals that are available that, that can build properly constructed buildings with the proper dimensions that speak to us, the more the non-professionals will try to make up for it by, by, by adding um, a pastiche of decorative elements that look silly, but it, it's not because the people are silly, it's because they're, they're, they're trying to, to express a need. Uh, any other answers to this question before I read the next question? Okay, let me read the next question from Zainab. How can we use modernist techniques to facilitate making desirable and beautiful spaces? I would like to take a, a crack at that. Uh, you, have to, you have to be careful what you mean by modernist techniques because the modernist design ideology uh, is oriented towards destroying the, the spaces and places that give you uh, positive feedback from a medical point of view. Another part of modernist techniques is using uh, technology uh, in an efficient way. Well, that we can certainly use. So there's no need uh, to make houses out of straw unless straw is, is the cheapest local material, in which case it should be encouraged. Just, why, just the same way there's no reason to make uh, glass and steel buildings everywhere around the world, in, in, especially in locations that this is imported and very, very expensive. So uh, the, uh, we are free today not to use modernist techniques, but to use anything available, the latest technology, the most uh, uh, efficient and uh, economical materials, which include old fashioned local materials plus new materials, but the, the geometry has to be healing and beautiful. So really uh, there's, there's the question of just using what's best available, not being rigid and sticking to anything, but being uh, absolutely insistent upon creating beauty with what's ever available. Who would like to add to that? I think, um, and thanks, Nico. Um, I, um, my practice designs occasionally contemporary buildings. And what we're doing with this work is we're taking 
the findings that we've uncovered in neuroscience that humans prefer certain patterns, particularly the facial pattern, um, three by three pattern, and then the, uh, the strong facial pattern, which is upper left, upper right and bottom center. And we've been infusing that into the designs and people and bilateral symmetry is, is really important. And then also enforcing or reinforcing the idea with patterns that occur uniformly throughout the project. So, it, and then also furthering that materials. So natural materials become really, really important. And then lastly, biophilia. So we're letting the views extend out from the home into you know, a forested scene. Uh, even if we plant something close to the house, so it's not a long view to a forest, but just close in garden court um, that reinforces the human's need to see nature. So it becomes materials, um, viewing of nature, biophilia, and then patterns that are built into the project most notably bilateral symmetry patterns. And um, we've been having actually really good success with it. People are responding in a real positive way. So um, it's try trying to use some of the science that we're uncovering and all this work to help infuse um, a feeling of pleasure. And I, I wanna say the word beauty is is I, I've been lecturing on this now since 2008. And uh, the word beauty is just full of, you know, all kinds of potholes that we have to deal with. You can substitute the word pleasure for the word beauty. And uh, maybe in your discussions, you can, instead of using beauty, say, let's create a scene or a house or a city that's pleasurable. It's the same thing. Beauty is a pleasure response. So um, it's sometimes you change the vocabulary slightly, the people that um, you're addressing will relax because beauty just has so many negative connotations that we've been fed now, as Ann said, for over a hundred years. So um, just maybe a small point, use the word pleasure instead of the word beauty, so. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Matthias Agbo Jr. who is um, representing Africa, an entire continent with many tremendous problems just like uh, uh, Asia. So Matthias, can you uh, join us? Please unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We cannot see you. Uh, okay. The network is a little slow here. Uh, I'll try ah. to put camera on. Well, we can certainly hear you. If, if uh, the camera does not work, then uh, please ask uh, your question. Oh, okay, great. Okay, for us here in Africa, we often struggle with uh, domesticating our native urban ideologies in our cities, especially considering that uh, mainstream urbanism hardly <coughs> acknowledge them. As designers and researchers, how do we how do we accommodate these local realities in contemporary placemaking? Hello, okay. did you hear that? Yes, yes, we do. We heard that. So please, uh, distinguished panel, let's answer Matthias. This very important question. Who wants to go first? I, well, I, I would, I'll start off and then hopefully <laughs> everybody else will join in. But um, so localized materials that people are used to seeing uh, and patterns are, are very, very important because again, it's a, about a pleasure response. It's about Am I comfortable in looking at this? Um, does it uh, create an approach response 
Um, or does it, am I not comfortable and it create an avoidance response? And so I, I think, you know, recognition of local patterns and local materials is, is really, really important. I think, you know, the culture evolves within a certain region and utilizing, again, local patterns and local materials. And people are comfortable with seeing that. They understand it. It's part of what Nant, uh, Anne was talking about, the narrative that is ingrained into a local society. And I think it's, I think it's really important to recognize those patterns and utilize them to the best effect you can. Alexandros, how does that, is that? Yeah, Alexander? That, that, that sounds um, just about right, I think. I think what has been, what we are discussing is generalizes across cultures because we're talking about how we respond to, to as I said, a certain grammar of design, and it's not related to style. So styles may differ across cultures, but the principles are exactly the same. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter where, where you come from. Uh, I think uh, the, the teachings from, from the film and from such discussions are the same. Uh, and do you want to go or should I go next? You can go okay. next. Okay, so um, Africa faces the same problems as India. And so the, the solutions are common uh, uh, based on local variations. Uh, the local architects know what to do, okay? Because they've been doing that for, for uh, generations. The state and the authorities and the money that comes in should help the local architects with the local solutions and not try to impose the top-down solutions that are uh, uh, beloved by large uh, agencies that have a lot of money. Th that's catastrophic. Uh, I think when, when people who really want to help, if a government really wants to help, they will realize that they cannot provide the local adaptation and the beauty that's required for a human environment. It is up to the local people and the local builders to do that, and they can do that much more efficiently. The government needs to help, okay? And, and um, another thing uh, is, is uh, um, what my uh, friend, the late uh, Munishwar Ashish Ganju in India emphasized, that there are two types of architectural infrastructure and urban solutions. The large-scale industrial solutions imported from the West simply do not work in the developing world but there are very efficient local solutions, low cost local solutions. They're totally different from the large scale industrial solution for infrastructure, for example, the plumbing and, and, the, and the sewage system and the water distribution. If we want to, we, we have the local efficient low cost solutions available, but usually the government has these ideas copied. We have to do what Paris did. Uh, in the 1920s. Well, no, that's not going to work in the developing world. Uh, it's too expensive and, uh, and it doesn't work. It's, it's just uh, um, um, you cannot translate one sort of a type of infrastructure to, to the other. Uh, so please encourage uh, the self-building. So, so the, the answer now to, to Matthias's uh, question is, uh, is a, a change of, of vision of how to see the best way of, of, of allowing the city to grow, of helping the city to grow, of letting the local solutions develop rather than the top-down imposition which has been imposed. And I'm afraid to say, but we have to face this, that some uh, uh, government uh, uh, agencies prefer the top-down system because it's more uh, liable to corruption. Because if you have money in one purse that's going to be given, <laughs> then it's easy to take a, a skim for a piece of that. We have to face that because the developing world is full of corruption. Uh, uh, contrary to the developed world, where I'm speaking from, where the corruption is hidden in very sophisticated ways. We still have corruption, but it's not the same kind of corruption. Okay, Ad, I think uh, it's up to you. Are you talking to me, Nikos? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, I think I think what you just said right now is absolutely the answer. You have to have bottom up 
And uh, one time in a, a small town, we gave the residents all a plan of a town intersection um, that was full of parking lots and horrible. It was the first thing you saw. And we asked them to draw with just little pieces of, uh, you know, with, 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 with just with chalk or with pen, or they could cut out pieces of paper of what they wanted to see. And we ended up with the most beautiful plan the town had ever seen. It had a coherent sense of narrative, it had small buildings along the edge, it had parking lots behind the buildings. You drove in the town, you immediately saw a theater and then opposite would be a fountain. It had a design no architect would have ever proposed because it was the people living there knowing what it was like going to that space every day. So actually what I've learned is there's a lot of incredible design ability in the public itself but they're never allowed to voice it. Nobody sets, a, gives them a place, a canvas where they can put their ideas out there. They know their community. They know where their children walk. They know where they need to go to go shopping. They really understand and live it. And often they call in outsiders to design who won't even be impacted by the designs. It doesn't make any sense. It makes it more disconnected. So I would always start with a charrette or with a, with a, with a use the people who live there and let them express their ideas, give them some pencil and paper um, and, and see what they put together and you'll be amazed. It'll be something beautiful because that's what they want. It's in us, what we need. Did that make any sense? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Anne. Uh, let me read the, the, uh, another question from Hossein. How are the major concerns we have for the environment, for the planet, and the critical loss of biodiversity we are grappling with, addressed with the concept of beauty, discussed and promoted here? Environment and environmental congruency were so majorly missing in the film and do not feature in the panel discussion. So let's add that in the panel discussion. Who would like to take a stab at that? Well, if I may say something. Uh... I would like to begin by saying that the film is not supposed to discuss all the issues of humanity. I mean, it's discussing a particular or some particular issues and it's doing it very successfully in my estimation. That's the, the first thing. The other thing is that the two are in fact connected in some ways, uh, which may not be as explicit as one might, might like, but they, they are. I mean, uh, think about the use of local materials or the use of materials that are, that are traditional materials as, uh, as opposed to, to steel and glass and things like that. These have also environmental consequences in the climate um, in terms of what, how much energy is used. Uh, I mean, you, I don't think you can properly insulate uh, a glass building. I mean, it's not my field, but that's my impression. So I think there are, uh, there are ways that the two are connected, but it's not the primary discussion here because it's a different discussion. That's my, my, my take on it. Uh, let me add something to what Alexandra said. Um, I, I think that the film has implications, or no, forget the film, because uh, uh, most people who will tune in will not have seen the film. The, the, uh, the realization that beauty is the fundamental part of, of human health and that the environment has to be designed with beauty in mind has an indirect effect on biodiversity and, and, and those issues. Namely that when we are concerned with beauty, we link to nature and we are not going to wipe out trees and kill animals just for the, for the industrial uh, sake of doing so. It is the industrial approach that we are fighting against the ugliness, the industrial ugliness that goes in and decides to destroy 200,000 trees, just like uh, a criminal decision was recently made in India, in Indian cities. Just cut down the trees because they, uh, they interfere with uh, a, somebody uh, drew a master plan that has these straight lines. So we have to cut down 200,000 trees. This is a criminal action. If we approach the shepherding of the, of the earth from the beauty point of view, we dare not cut down a tree. Okay, we have to think twice about it because we respect nature, because nature feeds us, we are part of nature. It is the opposite, the top-down industrial mindset 
that says, well, we are humans and we have the industrial strength and power and we can destroy the world in order to build giant skyscrapers. So uh, this indirectly will change uh, and, and create a, a better world, uh, I believe. Uh, Anne or uh, Donald. I don't really have anything to add. I, well said, Nikos. No, no, I think what you're saying is 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 really important, Nikos. It's it's a totally different way of thinking. And I think there's this great quote by a Buddhist um, who says, Daisaku Akita, he says, a successful vision of the future is not possible without an accurate knowledge of the past. And I think the fact is we have to understand how modernism came up. It was not only industrial revolution, new technologies, steel, glass, concrete, but it was also World War I and what that did to our brains and immediately followed 20 years later by World War II. And I think we have to understand how the traumas of the early 20th century created the trauma of modern architecture. They're directly linked. And by not looking at that, we re-traumatize in the 21st. At the same time, we have to have compassion. Um, what our ancestors or our grandparents, yeah. grandparents lived through um, or, and what happened in World War I and World War II was fantastically traumatic. Um, and so there is a reason people embraced modernism because they wanted to run from the past. You know, Gropius, the famous Bauhaus modernist would say to his students at Harvard, we're starting from zero, forget the past. Well, he was a World War I vet who 20 years earlier spent four years at the Western Front in the trenches of World War I. So you can see why he said that. Harvard didn't know they hired someone who was brain damaged. So modern architecture is a direct expression of the brain damage of World War I. Um, we didn't wanna look at that. Well, it's understandable. People don't like looking at painful things, but again, to quote the Buddhist, a successful vision of the future is not a possible without an, uh, an accurate knowledge of our past. We have to now a hundred years later, look at what happened a hundred years ago to understand how to build our world today. And until we do that, it's not going to work. I don't mean to be negative, but that's the way it works. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, so for anyone who is shocked at what Anne says, please uh, uh, listen to her talk in, uh, in the first two um, webinars in this series, number 64 and 65, where she develops these uh, points of view. This is not just a, a comment thrown out. This is a, a result of, of, of a very deep research. Uh, I want to go to a comment here by our friend and colleague, uh, Prem Chandavarkar, and read it out. Architects are trained in the fallacy that they provide meaning to the building. They do not realize that there is a process that begins after the building is completed and the architect vanishes from the scene. <laughs> the process of inhabitation that layers experience, memory, joy, and beauty onto the building. Well said, Prem. So we would like to reinforce that. Let's take turns. Who would like to reinforce that? Well, certainly um, um, a living space is a, a framework to allow all of those qualities that that gentleman just outlined to be, you know, set in place without, uh, you know, any any stressors being um, taking place, that it's coherent. So you give the occupants the ability to enrich their own space. So it becomes their own narrative and it becomes pleasurable. They understand it and they relax, uh, which is all very, very good for their health and well being. So uh, too often the architecture will force people into or preclude their ability to make it their own, to create their own narrative. And I think that's really one of the primary failures of modernism is pushing people into patterns that are not um, nourishing their health and well-being. Uh, let me continue with that. And um, 
pick out something very unhealthy in modernism that arose from the disassociation of the architect from the user. The myth of the genius architect who knows better than the user, who disdains to visit the building after it is completed. Because the architect says, I am a genius and the user is ignorant and I create this wonderful building. And then I don't care how people uh, react to it after it's finished. I'm, I'm done with, it's a work of genius. They have to live with it. Well, this is professional malpractice. It is like uh, the doctor who does an operation and then does not visit the patient to see if the patient is alive or dead after the operation. Okay, so this is just professional malpractice. And unfortunately, it is part of, of the ethos and the philosophy of modernism. We have to stop that, really, because it's, uh, uh, it's not, uh, the architecture profession is not serving the users, not serving humanity. And thank you, Prem, for, for pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you, Kurti, for giving us this option for, to bring everything together. You're really bringing the world together. And I, 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 I think it's so important because in the end of the day, we're, we're all the same really. And, and we're building for each other and, and just having this with Alexandros here, Don, we're at different time zones in the United States. We're in Italy, we're in, in India. This is just wonderful what you've done. Thank you so much for your leadership, Kurti. Uh, uh, uh. Nikos, is there anything else uh, or should we kind of you know, move towards uh, uh, conclusion? Nikos, are there any, any, any additional questions? Yes, one, uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, for, for Mashish, uh, just to read it out. Based on neuroscience for architecture, would it be right to say that beauty is fundamental response of a human being? globally, but architectural forms are an expression of beauty as a result of cultural and regional evolution of humans. And I would answer that very briefly. Yes, uh, beauty is, a, uh, is an expression of, of the culture and region evolution. Uh, however, the, uh, the message of today's uh, uh, lesson is that whereas local and regional uh, uh, expressions of beauty and responses to beauty are slightly varied. The human body is the same everywhere around the world. So there is, we have the general universal response to beauty. That's why Anne says she went to the Sagrada Familia and she felt wonderful. And I have been into a mosque and I feel wonderful. Okay, there is this universality and that's what the science shows, the universality with the local variations that are appropriate, but underneath the local variations, the mathematics is the same. So I, I, I would add to that real briefly, Nikos. Um, it, in my thinking, there's two types of beauty. There's the beauty that we're born with, we're inherited through our DNA, uh, the facial pattern, biophilia and forms from, from the human body are probably the three greatest pattern schemes that we inherit. But then there's also the type of beauty that we learn as we tune our brains to respond to our environment and we find what's pleasurable around us and we accept that and we push away what's not, not beautiful and what's not acceptable to us. So um, it, it seems like you know everybody has their own learned set of beautiful patterns um, and then everybody has this common sense of beauty which uh, certainly the facial pattern is because of something that we all deal with every day all day long we're born dealing with it our dna instructs us to so um, similarly biophilia and then forms from the human body. We evolved with those over millions of years. This is uh, some, as Anne says in the movie, you know, we're, we're born looking for these things. We're, we're not taught, we're born, born with it, so. And, and if I may add, I think the two were going together up until the, up until a hundred years ago. And then the, the effort started to artificially separate them. Wow. And, 
uh, exactly because I have this interest about parallels between music and architecture and language. I would like to just give you another quote, which, which I, with which I disagree completely. That's by Xenakis. He's, uh, he used to be an architect, then he became a modernist composer. And he's, he has written in all of his papers that the qualification of beautiful or ugly makes no sense for, for, for sound, he's talking about music, nor for the music that derives from it. The quantity of intelligence carried by the sounds must be the true criterion of the, valid, of the validity of a particular music. And I think this is wrong because the quantity of intelligence is indeed the measure of validity, but the instrument by which this intelligence is calculated is embedded in our appreciation of the music or of the architecture, and it's reflected in its affective influence. So it has to do with the language that that is the substrate upon which we build. And this is why I think the attempts to completely dissociate our uh, innate responses to, to architecture or to music from our consideration of beauty are doomed. And this is why they have not succeeded for 100 years now, because it's not because people are stupid, it's because people are people. You know, they're not robots. So, <laughs> Okay, Kirti, whenever you want, we can finish. <clears throat> no, I think, uh, no, if, if, if you're finished at your end and I'll take a few minutes to kind of, you know, mm. sum up and, and before I thank you. I think there are a few points that I'd like to make uh, in the connection with the discussion that's going on. First of all, beautiful, beautiful film. And thank you, thank you, Don, uh, and thank you, everyone, for making it possible for us to see this. Uh, well, I just a few points that I would like to make is this, that, you know, I read somewhere a long time ago, and this was a claim by Russian scientists, that they say that we play music in our cow sheds, you know, in our animal houses, and the cows give more milk the music impacts the productivity. And the, because the music makes animal happy, joyous, mm -hmm. and that reflects in their productivity. If animals are sensitive to music, human being must be sensitive to beauty, to aesthetics, to things pleasurable, things which are beautiful. And therefore, not to understand the meaning and a contribution of beauty is being very insensitive. That you know that 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 that, that the animals, I think, you know, respond to that, and the human being obviously must. And therefore, beauty and aesthetics and pleasure has a great role to play when it comes to your physical built environment. This is, the, this is the one part. Second part is just because, you know, we are talking about, you know, cities in the larger context, not only the buildings. I, 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 I remember uh, a very interesting uh, presentation uh, many years ago at a, at, a, at a workshop, at a seminar in Ahmedabad at the Institute, National Institute of Design. There was a seminar on design for development. And a very famous you know, public intellectual called Ramesh Thapar was a keynote speaker. And he made a very interesting observation. What he said was this, that waves of vulgarity are invading our cities. And he said, I often think in this context, what is the role of a sensitive designer? Is a good architect supposed to build one sensitive building among 99 ugly? Or should he really work also towards sensitization of the society so that 99 ugly buildings don't come up? And I think in the Indian context, this is a very, very important thing in two contexts. 
One is my understanding is this, that when he was talking about you know, waves of vulgarity invading our cities, he was not only talking in the visual terms alone. He was talking in terms of social terms, in terms of pollution, in terms of inequality, in terms of poverty, in terms of deprivation, and in terms of drudgery and all that. And therefore, when you talk about beauty, you've got to kind of go beyond and see in this larger context, in the context of our cities and making our cities. Second important, third important point, which is required to be made in the context of India, that only a small portion of the built environment is created by architects not more than 10%, probably even less of those buildings get created by architects. And therefore, if you're talking about the holistic concept, if you're talking about the, the, the beauty of the built environment as a whole, you've got to think in multiple ways. And that is this. But what about those 90% of the building which come up and how do they become beautiful? But more than that, to me, what is a very important question to ask is, if only 10% are contributed by architects, then what role are they playing? And this is an example that you, know, uh, you gave, uh, Nikos, that if country is building 20 million houses and the prime minister's housing program, but the country is building 30 million houses under the Pradhan Mantri Gramin Housing Yojana. What contributions are architects making to make them beautiful? And I make beautiful in the larger context, not only beautiful to live, beautiful, beautiful to see, but beautiful also to leave, improving livability. And therefore, that's a very important question to ask in terms of what role are architects playing? How are we sensitizing them? What kind of involvement and engagement that they have? This was the third small point. The fourth point, and this is the point that Anne made, and I think you, know, you also made, Nikos, about this bottom-up thing. I was involved in a very interesting program where government of India helped government of Sri Lanka build 50,000 houses for the war victims. There was a very serious possibility of this house is being built by commercial contractors. Some people intervene and the project changed direction. Out of 45,000 houses which are complete now, 44,000 houses are built by people themselves, by residents by occupiers, by people who own them. And this changed the whole context of the program. In my understanding, it is not only in the context of beauty or aesthetic sense, in terms of satisfaction that the people have, ownership of the process that the people have. Not only, I think, on the kind of houses that happen, and they're certainly much better than what a contractor would have built. Even though this are meant for people who, who just come out of a bitter 30-year-old war, almost every second family contributed resources for beautification, for enlargement, for many other things. And more than anything, I personally believe that the whole process of that doing it led to self-respect, led to, I think, some kind of empowerment, led to a sense of achievement that we did this. And, and housing and creation of, 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 of settlement essentially has this whole potential to, to kind of you know, go beyond just the physical product in terms of what it does to your psyche, what you does to your kind of, you know, uh, 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 your 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 self-respect.
In that context, and before I end, let me kind of give you a very small example in that particular project. We at one point of time organized a workshop of the people who are involved in planning, designing, and, 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 and facilitating that project. And that also included five people who had completed that houses. In that meeting, there was a woman who had completed her house. Now she narrated her experience. You know what she said? She said, I tried to commit suicide three times. He said, my husband died in the war. My father-in-law lost his mental balance, he is uh, mad now. My first son, uh, elder son, got bullet in his leg and he is uh, suffering. And my younger son is lost. And we have not meant to find him for a long time. He said, I was so depressed that I decided to kind of end my life. And I made attempt three times. I failed. I, 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 I didn't die. He said, then came this housing project. And I was asked that you design, you build your house, you'll be given money, you make your choices, you hire your builders, you hire your uh, carpenter, mason, you do whatever. She so said, I worked on this for 12 months and here is the house that I've created. And then she says, you know what it did to me? I, one who was essentially preparing to commit suicide, now I'm ready. Give me any problem, I will solve it for you. And you could see that, that confidence uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on her face. It was not just a presentation. She was talking from within. She was talking about her self-realization and what the process did. So this is what bottom is bottom up is all about. And therefore, when you talk about, you know, it's it talk about, I think, you know, creating a built environment. You're talking about relating with built environment. These are a large number of factors that need to be considered. And I'm exceedingly happy that we had the we had the opportunity to see this amazingly beautiful film, uh, uh, learn so much, uh, learn so much from so many angles. This is a subject on which you don't think too much, don't hear too much, and therefore this was a new experience. And thank you, Don, for making it possible for, for screening this, this, this movie. And uh, we, would, we would want to see that it reaches many more and, and enriches us. So, so thank you also, yeah. Nikos, you know, for making this possible. Without your intervention and help and enthusiasm, this would not have been possible. So thanks again. Thank and uh, for your remarkably insightful comments and, uh, and, 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 and observation. And thank you, Ellen Dandos, uh, for, for your observations and, and comments. Uh, let me also thank uh, Eureka Research and the happyo.org for the partnership, knowledge partnership and this webinar. And of course, I must thank my colleague, Ankisha, who makes everything possible.